why did you choose to tell it like this? Yeah. Well, yeah, you know what's stuff. really awesome? It's time for the podcast. Yay! It <laughs> <laughs> was so like, love is that, I was like, I was like is, that the, is that the introduction? <laughs> Wait, guys, we're in, a, we're in a podcast. Are we? We have a podcast. <laughs> Well, welcome everyone to the semi-bookish podcast. Yes. Um, this is I don't even know what episode we're on anymore. I never know what episode Me we're on either. until I upload it, and then I go, "Oh, it's like episode sixty-nine or something like that." Uh, which I think I that might have been way the last. I think that, that might have been possibly. Mm-hmm. I think I we're think, in the 60s. I think oh, the last okay. episode was 69, so I think we're in the 70s now. So yay! Oh, that's nice. So almost 70 episodes in, or around that area. Yeah. Um. And it, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on the uh, topic of the podcast in a bit. Uh, first of all, hi, Tony. Uh, what are you reading? Um, or playing or reading? watching or... Um, um, so I'm reading two things right now. Yeah. Um, one of them is... I have not read since I was 12, maybe? Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a series of uh, Star Wars books that are now part of the Legends uh, lore yeah, series. Lore and they're, so they're not canon, um, which is fine because they're still really great. And they're, they're canon to us. Well, I mean, I. Which well, then votes the question because I don't know any word, honestly, anything about it in general. Are any of the books canon? Yes, I love the distinction between legends and canon because legends doesn't mean that it's gone away. It just means that it's not the current canon. Yeah, it's not the canon. It's not. What's, it's not the current lore. It's, it's not. Yeah, it's not current. And current canons, canon is like ripping from legends all over the place, which is what they, I mean. That's kind of why not. Okay. So legends is like the the book, like like it's all of the stuff that happened when George Lucas was in control and for good, for bad, for worse, for whatever. So it's like the mythos you know? of yeah, the, it's, the it's, universe. Yeah, it's almost like, yes, it's like the encyclopedia. They're just a whole bunch of books and series and so on and so forth, so you get real nice details and then the canon is like the actual current building of the story and the timeline and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Um, I like both. I understand people have reservations but I like both. But this particular series um, is called Jedi Apprentice, and it takes place from... So I'm starting with the first book, which is uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi is about to turn 13, and when Jedi turn 13, if they don't have a paddle, if they're not apprenticed to a Jedi Master... If they've not so are they cho- not padawan by that age? Yeah, if they've not been chosen by that age, then they join the Agricultural Corps um, and become farmers, essentially. Please um, tell me Obi-Wan got picked... Uh, Where is he on the agricultural team? So, game? initially, Obi-Wan does not get chosen. We all know that eventually he does by Qui-Gon Jinn, but he yeah. is not chosen by Qui-Gon Jinn and is sent off to this other, this mining planet to deal, to become a part of the agricultural corps. Qui-Gon Jinn, however, has just been asked by the Galactic Senate to go deal with issues on that exact same So that's how he meets... So... So is this kind of like a... a, Not really, but kind of like a... How um, Qui-Gon Jinn and uh, Obi-Wan were sent to Anakin's planet, and then is this kind of like a similar So basically the whole series... But not as... The whole series follows him from that perspective, from from the original, like, oh, I have... I, I'm not going to be a Jedi all the way up to, you know, like pre-episode one stuff. So mm-hmm. like you really go through his whole training period and see all of the things that they went through as Master and Apprentice. Um, it's really very good, especially if because at the time that I was reading them, episode one was all that we had of those two characters and their relationship. And then episode, and you know... <laughs> Spoilers! Spoilers! Darth Maul kills Qui-Gon. So you don't get more of that relationship at all. And so I was, like, keen on that. And they're all, they're super easy chapter books. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're perfect for, like, nine or ten year olds to read. And I just devoured them over and over and over again because they were just delicious. And then the other book that I'm reading mm-hmm. is uh, Eldest by Christopher Paolini. I'm listening to the audiobook. Uh which is read by the fantastic Gerard Doyle. He is fantastic. Um, his Saphir voice makes me 
grateful that he got a paycheck because to have to do that to your voice for the number of for the amount of time that Sophia talks in those books is like I hope they paid you well because <laughs> that's that's a, that's just a lot on the voice but he's a fantastic uh, character actor and he's he's great um, so yeah listening to those because Murtag is coming in November and I just need to reread so that's yeah. what I'm reading great me yes Wait, yeah. are you are you playing anything <sighs> I just finished a, another playthrough of Jedi Survivor. Good job. Um, and I, like, upped. I, I did the Jedi Master level. Oh, you upped the level? Yeah, it's going to be a while before I decide to go as Grand Master. I say this, it'll probably be next week. Anyway. Great. Um, I'm reading a few things. Yay! Um, I am reading... I, 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 oh, I keep forgetting the author's name. So... It's called Deer, no, The Deer by Dashiel Carrera. Oh. Um, not super far. It's it's a short book, so I should be okay. Familiar, but what's it about? Um, so the it starts out with he gets in a car accident. Oh. He, <laughs> he supposedly hits a deer. Uh-huh. He claims there was no deer. The police say that there was. It, it's a it's a whole thing. The whole book's about memory and blah 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 uh, blah. Okay. okay. Um, so you jump, you jump forward and backward in time a lot. Mm. And uh, now we'd like to know if there was actually a deer. That's what I know. I mean, that, it's called the deer. And it, <laughs> so one would hope and, that. And it, yeah, I don't know. He, there could be a swerve, and there could be absolutely no deer. He no, could no, have actually hit another. On, on, on page number one, there's a reference to Schroden, Schrodinger's cat because he's like a physicist. So. Is there a deer? Is there not a deer? Maybe like, at the same time. At you know? the end, there could, it, be, not, it, it, there it, could it, be no deer, and what he could have hit was another car. No, no, I don't. I'm it, just saying that he, one way or the or other, tree, you gotta find out. Or a lamppost, yeah, or possibly. a person, or mm-hmm. a cat, or I don't know. It's It, it thinks <laughs> it's a little bit more clever than it actually is, I think. But um, <laughs> it, overall, it's, it's, in, it's been enjoyable so far. I, I like yeah. the language and stuff. Um, okay. It's very yeah. sparse. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, no, and I'm I'm slowly, you know, the 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 background of the characters and everything is slowly revealing itself. Mm. There's some undercurrents of like childhood abuse and stuff that's mm, coming sure. coming to light. He was driving back to his hometown after his father died, uh, and uh, to meet with his brother, and um, yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, it's kind of like uh, um, the sound and the fury, which. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where it it'll oftentimes jump through time mid paragraph and stuff like that. So it's it's very interesting. Oh, that is interesting in that yeah. regard. Um, yeah, and like I said, it's a it it makes sense because it's about memory and time and blah 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 blah. Sure. So yeah, sure, sure, sure. That's the other thing you read. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> forgot. Um, I'm reading through. Man and His Symbols by Carl G. Jung. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. probably not going to finish it. No? Because I wasn't a fan of Jung before, and this hasn't greatly increased my <laughs> appreciation of, of the merits of his uh, okay. ideas and stuff. Sure. I don't know. I had a grudge against him mainly for his influence on Joseph Campbell in the hero's story. Um, oh, that's interesting, yeah. especially given the subject I know, today. I know. It kind of, kind, of, <laughs> kind of fits together. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, his his whole thing is about how the unconscious is made up of various archetypes and stuff, sure. which is, you know, which make up the collective unconsciousness of a civil, civilization. And, sure. Sure, sure. You know, and that kind of, uh, you know, which is the repository of all of our yes. historical instincts and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's like we're all walking symbols and, yeah. you know, it's like you turn a half a corner and you're almost at reincarnation. <laughs> yeah, way. no, it's yeah. very it's very it's very close to spiritualism. Mm. Uncomfortable which is kind of it um if you've ever seen the movie um A Dangerous Method, which is very good. It's about I mean part of it's about the relationship between Jung and Freud and how their friendship uh, how they went their separate ways. Yeah. Which, you know, you know cuz Jung was going in increasingly Kind of wig- wiggity wiggity direction. Sure, sure. Um, and Freud wanted to stick with the science. Um, so Freud claims. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, Freud is. I, Freud is Freud. We I, all I, I, I also just read uh, Civilization and Its Discontents by Freud. I've, I okay. enjoyed that much more. Okay. Um, okay. And while 
psychoanalysis has been superseded. Yeah, sure, a of lot. Course, but of the, 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 in in broad strokes, I find both him and Jung interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Like they, yeah, yeah, yeah. like for their time, they were great thinkers, and they pushed. We wouldn't have sure. actual modern psychology without without the two of them. The two of them. Yeah, no, that's very true. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's interesting to see, you know, where they're coming from, and I definitely vibed with Freud's ideas more. Sure. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. And you all know that psychoanalysis really just came about because, you know, he was in the right Art Nouveau circles. <laughs> oh, yeah? He oh. was in the art circle, so... Uh, I know his children were artists, right? He, I, Freud? I don't know. Yeah, or like his oh. daughter or something. Oh, that's cool. Well, Freud was... I didn't even know he had kids. Freud was coming to big time because he was around the same time as, like, Jackson Pollock and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so he was in some of the parties with them. Sure. And, sure. uh... Like artists such as like Pollock and all the rest of them that come along with that time during that period of art history, um, were all basically using psychoanalysis from him <laughs> to try to figure out why they were like to like either influence their art, figure out why they were having problems. Like I think sure. Pollock was kind of like alcoholic or something at some point. Mm. And so there was like a whole entirety of a lot of his paintings kind of also reflect that. Oh, interesting. Period. Some of some of his older paintings that were set during that time reflect on the psychoanalysis yeah, stuff that was like... done by him. And so then you have like a lot of the art critics turning around and like talking about Jungian psychology with the psychoanalysis and all that fun mm -hmm. stuff. And so then it just kind of like expands from there. That's so, you know, there's a lot of art history that comes along with that. Cause sure. Oh, that they're just, they're, you could just, you know, use the art history as psychos like constantly. <laughs> it just works. No, it's interesting actually to think all of that playing with it, playing with it. Cause it changes. I mean, certainly it changes the way that literature functioned after that. Um, because, you know, I, I I know Jung had it had a, at least a little influence on um, Finnegan's Wake. Oh, stories, really? Which would make a lot of sense since yeah, I didn't realize how big a part uh, dream analysis was in Jung's sure, stuff. Sure, sure. And in the actual it's like insanely huge. Yeah, yeah, and it's and very much Jung. Yeah, and if you I've started but ne never finished um, <laughs> Finnegan's Wake. Sure. Um, Sure. But uh, there's it's definitely there's definitely a lot of dream there's a dream flow to it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of symbolism and stuff, so I can definitely see how he would have influenced him. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Oh. That's that's why I'm doing. And I'm not playing anything at the moment, but I'm probably gonna start a re playthrough of the Bioshock series soon. Ooh, oh cool! So nice. It's one of my favorite series. Nice. Yeah. I wanted to bring them up on the. Uh, We've had two video game episodes, haven't we? Yeah, we, we have. We never brought up Bioshock, did we? No, we did no, not. No, you did not. I think it's one of the best arguments for video games as an art form. But, Aaron. Ooh. Oh, we even had a video game as an art form. I know. We, we, could, we, that, we, 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 we did that on the first yeah, episode. Yeah, we did. It's, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> it's done and, done and buried. <laughs> you poor soul. You were so tense that entire episode. <laughs> but once I have fun. Yeah. Good, good. <laughs> what um, are you reading, Aaron? At the moment. Watching? <laughs> Reading not much, and that's only because of what I'm playing has just kind of over cap, overtaken that. Yes, you and the rest of, of the gamers world. at the moment. So, yeah. so I'll just explain how my week started to go last week. Is I started playing. I, I wasn't planning on playing the game as soon as I was. Mm -hmm. um, so I started playing Pathfinder Kingmaker again. Right. So I was playing through that, um, and if. Anybody doesn't know anything about Pathfinder, it is similar to D and D because it's also a tabletop RPG. Sure. However, Pathfinder is slight. The rules are different. There's mm -hmm. there's slight differences in between, and I haven't figured out the nuances between each one sure. yet. Sure. Yeah. But like, I know for a fact that like there's different skill sets and there's different things that go into it. Mm -hmm. um, different roles that you have to do that are also different in how it works um fun game i haven't finished it yet i'm still kind of going through with it um sure, sure. the premise of pathfinder king maker is uh, you have been called in with a whole bunch of other people to um a new pursuit 
Mm-hmm. These sword lords who live, like, just a hop, step, and a jump have given out a bounty for this guy called the Stag Lord. And the Stag Lord is this bandit king who's kind of taken over this area called the Stolen Lands. Mm-hmm. And the Sword Lords want him gone. Yeah. And the proposed reward for getting rid of this bounty, or like getting rid of the Stag Lord in general, is you become the Baron or the Baroness of those stolen lands. Like, those are now yours. You now have a kingdom. Congratulations. Right, right. Um, So you um, end up in this whole entire thing where there's this gnome guy from another place called Pitax, and he is trying to subterfuge his way through the whole entire thing and ruin it so Pitax can get this extra land for themselves. Mm -hmm. So he's, at this point... You end up splitting half of the people that you can have, and you can have all of them. You like you get all the companions sure. like later on. Sure. Um, but you get half and half, and you are going along with your group, and you have to stop him, mm. and then stop the stag lord. And the thing about Pathfinder is that is slightly different from D and D, and I will say I like D and D more for this, is that Pathfinder gives you a time limit for that quest. That whole entire thing. Oh, you have a... Okay. So, okay. to kill, get rid of the stag lord and your rival, and the fact that there's this, like, weird nymph lady who's talking to you and saying mm-hmm. that there's this whole entire, like, curse upon these lands and you need to figure out what's going on, mm-hmm. a lot, among with some other things, you have 90 days, in-game days. In-game, okay, sure. Not, like, IRL days, but, like, yeah. in-game. Yeah. To get rid of this. Mm, okay. Problem. Okay. And to travel between sections, it takes time. Sure. So, for example, I think that I I know you can do it quicker because I know that there's a special like achievement slash reward that you get if you do this in under thirty days. Sure. Sure. Usually, I make it to around like day fifty or something. Okay. So you're not playing Pathfinder Kingmaker no, right now. No. Why? <laughs> uh, the reason being is because I was playing Pathfinder and then I kept staring off into the distance and there was this little icon on my desktop and I just kept going, I keep seeing things about it. I keep needing to play it. I love this studio. I love the studio so much that I had to start playing Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And Baldur's Gate 3 definitely is one of, in my opinion, one of the best games of this past decade. Someone was telling me they thought it was going to make Game of the Year easily. It could... It depends on how Starfield does tomorrow. I was just thinking about Starfield, um, yeah. So, the, so, People are already complaining about stuff. Yes, I know. But of course, listen, because they listen, had listen, early listen, access. Listen. I know, I know. I'm right. So, from what I can see, Starfield, and I just pre-ordered it, slash, like, I got the nice version so i can get the dlc my birthday actually my brother might be a but anyway but the um (laughs) starfield from what i can see from people talking about early access is it is one of the most completed bethesda games they've ever played in their entire lives everyone says that about every new bethesda game so i will tell you about three no no it's playable it just works no (laughs) i mean no they're saying that it's playable without mods which is saying something. I mean, something. they're all playable without mods. The only yes. people who don't think that they are are people who are obsessed with modding things. I, yeah, which I, is so me. fine. So me. Like, but I anyways, don't have a problem with mods. I just think but, it's funny that people are like, I can um, play this game and it's still good without I mods. I think like, <laughs> it will depend on how Starfield does tomorrow when sure. it is fully released. But Within the next few months, yeah. We'll see how Baldur's Gate 3 is... So far, one of the best games. It's the most talked about. It from, is from this one year. of the most talked about. So, but it is one of the. It is fully complete. You can do things that I didn't think you could do, but fully mimics D and D. Yeah. You can unalive enemies, and you can put them in your character sack, and then you can throw those unalived people at other people for fun. Which I it, think is from fun. what I've seen of it. It does seem like it's it's. More than any other games yet, it's captured the freedom of D and D. It like, really has. If if if, if you think um, you can do something, you probably can. One of my favorite oh, parts cool. is I was in a boss fight on accident, and I didn't mean to call this boss into the fight because I wanted to talk to them and see what was happening, but <laughs> did not happen. I was accidentally put in. They were right on the edge of a chasm. I shoved them into the chasm and won. Like you, you can know, do that. Um, I started yeah. a boss fight by literally blowing up somebody's throne. 
for fun because <laughs> I wanted to see what happened. <laughs> you can, um, there is a character who's, there is, she's, a, they're not a character that you can like keep, um, mm-hmm. but they're a goblin and they're stuck inside of a cage mm-hmm. and there's a, a tiefling who is pointing a crossbow at them and they are angry mm-hmm. because, uh, of what other reasons you can turn around and you can like threaten the goblin in the cage Mm -hmm. and in that same breath step in front in between the tiefling and the goblin like i'm gonna protect the goblin Mm -hmm. she can tell you to move out of the way and you can either dissuade her like you can deceive her you can persuade her you can intimidate her yeah or my favorite you can just immediately just like walk back out of the way and let it continue for absolutely no reason Um, it's a great game, Um, and I'm actually, and I've explained this to Grant, but I'm following a character that I've made since Dragon Age Origins, Yeah. and I have slowly wormed her into almost every single fantasy franchise I can think of. Well, that's... So I started her in Dragon Age Origins, Yeah. I made her go into Skyrim, and then Oblivion, Sure. in that order, by the way, which is very (laughs) much impossible, but I did it. not impossible. I'll, I can explain the reason why in, in a bit when we're talking about the storytelling aspects, things of genres and other. Maybe, yeah. But, sure. Um, <laughs> it, 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 she got kid. She opened up an Elder Scroll and Dawnguard DLC, and it transported her back because well, yeah, Elder right. Scrolls exist. Yeah. yeah exactly. um, but anyways, yeah. and then she ends up in Divinity: Original Sin two because she got kidnapped, and then she became the ruler of her the area that she just fixed, mm-hmm. and then got kidnapped again, and now she's in this game. Whatever. And it just works. Whatever works. It works, Whatever. but it makes it more hilarious it because works. her character, her character is very um, chaotic, good. Okay. But yeah. the character that she's romancing is very much chaotic, uh, evil. <laughs> so yeah. it's completely opposites. opposites apparently. Um, meanwhile, there's um, I, I haven't found her yet, but there's a lady, a te- um, demon lady who's on fire. And apparently she's a really, really great romance. And I need to find her, and I haven't gotten to her yet. I know where she is. You'll get there. But, you know. You have plenty of time of all the living that you're playing, so I think you'll get there. Uh, yeah. And uh, to start this, the rest of this episode off, I'd first like to say happy birthday, Tony. Oh, yeah. Yay. Happy birthday. Yay. Happy birthday. If you are listening to this, it is the day before my birthday. Or maybe it's after. Or it's and so this episode know. is Tony's pick. So, ah. Tony, what is this episode about? Genre. I'm I'm fascinated by genres. I think they are so interesting, and um, they can say a lot. They can say as much or as little as you want about the story that you're trying to tell. I think, um, depending on the angle that you are coming from. Tony's gonna pick our brains about genres today. Yeah, so I kind of want to know. Oh no, um, I'm terrified. I'm well, first and foremost, this is a very simple question. <laughs> <laughs> what are genres that you find yourself returning to over and over? Oh, again? okay. I was about to say, what's your favorite? And I was no, be like, you can't ask like me that question. I, that I'm an, gonna flip the table. It is an increasingly unfair question. Mine will always and forever be fantasy. That will always be the foundational genre for me. But to call it my favorite is a little unfair because it's like, well, it's the one that hooked me first. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. It's not the one that. It's not actually any better than any others. It's just one of the many. Um, that I love and enjoy and get something out of. But anyway, so like, what are genres that you find yourselves returning to mm. over and over again, mm. just naturally, and the things that you enjoy? I would say for me, mm-hmm. uh, definitely, yes, fantasy. Mm-hmm. But that's just because when I was younger, that's kind of what I grew up on sure. in general. Yeah. Um, for context, as much as I talk about it, my mom was a big, giant Harry Potter fan. Mm-hmm. And so I basically grew up immersed in that well sure um video game wise both of my brothers are intense fantasy people Mm -hmm. i grew up sitting in their lap while they played fantasy games horror games sure um those kind of things Mm -hmm. um like devil may cry goblins king's quest Mm -hmm. space quest uh, uh, Final Fantasy. Fantasy's yeah. in the title, but like it's sure. like those types of games. Like I grew up into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I first started playing video games, it was Kirby, which is if you really want to go that far, fantasy. Straight up. Um, <laughs> yeah. I play it as much as it's not really marketed as a fantasy. Uh, Rugrats had a video game out. 
Um, and I consider that pretty much fantasy because you are two years old and you're in a giant robot. <laughs> their, their, their imagination. It's, that's, that's, oh. that's, that's, <laughs> but, I have some problems with Rugrats is fantasy, but this is one of the problems with genre, so carry on. <laughs> and, um, but there's that. Um, I also really like mystery mm-hmm. type things. Sure. I like. I also grew up a lot on Nancy Drew. I didn't read the books, sure. but yeah. she has computer games. Oh, and yeah. so my mom yeah. and I, yeah. my mom hate doesn't really care for playing video games. She plays Tetris, and that's like it. Sure. Um, but she would sit down, and we would play Nancy Drew. Because they're probably like puzzle games and. Yeah, like it's more point yeah. clicky. Um, oh, well, but yeah, but it's more. It yeah. is quite literally your mystery book. It's the mystery books that are upstairs, but they're putting it into video game format. Yeah, right. And so I like mystery aspects of things. I do like sci-fi as well. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm not really into like I I say this with as even though I do read it more like contemporary like literary fiction. Sure. I'm sure. not really into those, and that's just because yeah. they talk, and that's all they do. Let's be clear. I think that contemporary... Okay. See, there was my small, tiny gripe about genre that we yeah. could get into. But it's just not my thing. Because so I get bored. Yeah, no, I, get I get that. bored. And if I get bored halfway through, I stop. When you say contemporary stories, do you mean stories in, that are in the contemporary setting? Kind of. Okay. Yes. It's, it's just more... So stories that are like... Like, does that include contemporary romances, or does that just it depends. mean anything it set depends. now is just kind of like... When I was a teen, I used to actually really like your Sarah Dressens and uh, sure. those kind of, like, contemporary romances. Yeah. But it was very rare. Mm-hmm. So I would read them, and then I would get bored, and i have to put it down, and then I could pick it up later. Sure, sure. But if it was as much as... We have our gripes about them. I would pick up the paranormally romancey fantasy romance, like Wings, like yeah, April and Pike. Gripes against rom. I, uh-huh. love par- I love paranormal romance. I but, want it done well. But like, I would pick up those. Um, I think I picked up Iron King at some point too. That sure, series. Sure. But like those like fairy romances when they were really more popular, yeah. uh-huh. before Sarah J. Moss happened. But um, yeah, yeah. I, but even she doesn't do contemporary no, stories. No, but like. Yeah. Those are contemporary, kind of in the setting of they were more modern settings. Yeah. Because well, yeah, uh, Iron King and Wings romances. are both modern set. Yeah. They but there's that aspect of fantasy in them that like I could get into. But if it's just like, it's boy, just about people doing things that people do for whatever reason. I get bored. Like, okay. No, I, I, get I got bored halfway through like the third Twilight book because at some point it was just like. Them being like talky, but what, 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 yeah, no, 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 mm-hmm. no. oh, no, I did so much more. <laughs> okay. No, 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 I finished it late, but like what happened was, is I got like into it, yeah, and then they just started not doing things for a hot minute because there was just like a lull period at some point, and I was just like, eh, that's interesting, don't care. I always thought of Eclipse as the most active of the four books, um, but. I also read Min, uh, New Moon in one day in the middle of the night. Yeah, I read New Moon entirely too fast, despite the fact that... I now, really shouldn't have. I can't read New Moon anymore because there's too much of Bella whining, and I'm like, mm-mm, nope. No. I'll just watch the movie. I read it in one day, and I really shouldn't have. I probably... If I would have... Why? Why? Because it was in the middle of the night, and it hurt my eyes. I read it in the dark. Grant, <laughs> what are genres that, <laughs> what are genres that you find yourself returning to over and returning over to? Um, I guess I'm kind of like you guys in that I grew up reading like more or less fantasy and sci-fi and stuff. However, most kids, yeah, I I definitely gravitated towards sci-fi. I guess sure. in, in the end, sure, um, sure. Uh, yeah. So so sci-fi is one. Um, mm-hmm. I, as far as, hmm, hmm, very good question. I know. Um, <laughs> so I, I do that. I, I, I enjoy um, thrillers. Um, whenever I actually sit down to write something, mm. it usually ends up either horror or horror adjacent. Sure. Um, which I don't always read horror. Yeah, yeah. But um, if I'm creating something that usually usually in that sphere. It's very interesting. Um, I, uh, 
with and with with like genre fiction or whatever um i typically gravitate it just sounds super pretentious but i really don't care like elevated horror or elevated sci-fi or fantasy where what do you mean by that they need to be reaching for something greater than just checking the boxes of so you're genre. not as interested in pulp no I like I like yeah. pulp sci-fi art and stuff like oh the art is fantastic but art it, is fantastic but as far as like sitting down and reading something like I need it to be reaching for something higher and, 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 and like as the older I get the if it's not aspiring for something more I just I don't give it a I just don't care yeah you know it. I I don't have time for it <laughs> this, is, this is one of the reasons that I really wanted to have this conversation because I knew this would this would naturally come out of it I'm finding that I'm becoming very much the opposite the older I get. I'm returning to the 12-year-old that had no idea that I loved pulp. There's a there's a there's a cultural trend going that way as well. There is is there? I I found like okay. a, a a re a retroactive appreciation of pulpier mm-hmm. like previously, you know, uh, it, it, it held yeah. held in lower regard I stuff. Was, I would agree with media. that. Yes. Yeah, I would agree with that. Thanks. And I, I went on, I I I was like that for a while. In just the, my current path, I'm going. Yeah, yeah certainly. Yeah, I think that there's um, that. I, hmm, I find this to be very interesting. Um, oh, so, a, a so the elevator. Uh, no, 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 no. I don't think that. I don't think it's a bad thing. I'm kidding. I, okay, so in I'm kidding. Of, in terms of elevated, I want to explore this idea of elevated, elevated and, genre. And I'm not I'm, because the, that the, the, the line can be thin. You know. It can oh be, sure, but I mean that's the question. Is that like if you're elevating? Which means you're reaching for, what are you reaching for apart from whatever it is that you love about the genre that led you to be there in the uh, first place? Grander statements. They're they're trying to either make grander statements about something, or they're they're reaching outside the pre-existing boundaries of said genre. Sure. They're, either they're bringing in elements of other genres, or yeah. they're just forging their own path. They use sure. a genre as it's as they're like point of embarkation <laughs> yeah yeah no no i i would yeah okay that's interesting i'm elevating my hand because Aaron, i have a question, yes. What's um, your question? For, for those who don't know slash me slash you know in general who are not literary snobs in general who don't know these sure. terms off the top of my head sure what do you mean by elevation when you say elevated what, what i just elevated what I just job, said. so that's your definition <laughs> i mean i mean like put it, it in it's, simple it's words used, it's used <laughs> okay it, it, i'll use it in terms of like in the film world people talk about Elevated horror a lot nowadays. I see. Like I'll say, art housey stuff, like okay. hereditary sure. art, art housey horror. Like, yeah, like artistic stuff. Oh, where you kind of like. So in, instead it, it, of elevated, you you would say this is more like the let's go to the indie film instead, instead of like the um, yeah I mean, mass produced film. Yeah, like like it, uh, like the pulp version of horror is like your slashers and your you know. So like instead of going producers. to go see Scream, this is like your indie horror film. Yeah, yeah. Okay. or like The Exorcist. I'd say The Exorcist, in my definition, would be an elevated horror film. Because would you? Because it, it covered. It, or yes, is, is it? Would you? Is it? Is it elevated because enough time has gone by that it is viewed as a veritable <laughs> classic of the genre? I would. Uh, or is it actually, if you look at the horror films that were made of its in its day and of its style, would you say that it is actually trying to achieve something more than the movies that fit within its domain? If you were to ask uh, William Friedkin, I think he would say that he was not trying to make an elevated horror well, film. Well, yeah, but that's immaterial. Well, yeah, no, no, I'm saying, but I, I, I would disagree with him in that. I feel it. Um, it's there's so much. It suggests so much in mm-hmm. that one film. Yeah. Um, that, and I'm not saying like it started. Okay. I literally okay. Forgot. So I late, I, I'd say late '60s, early '70s horror came of age with like movies like Eyes Without a Face in the '60s and stuff. Sure. Yes. 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 And then The Shining, which uh, one critic called like the first epic horror film, which I would, in a way, I would definitely agree with. Just when how The Shining wasn't that the '80s. That was, yeah, that was 1980 actually, yeah. or 1979. One of those two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Those, those are, those are like some of the first 
<laughs> and, and I'm just using film as a yeah, as no, an no, example. No, no. Those, 1980. Those those would be like classic heightened elevated horror. I'd call it nowadays something like Hereditary or Midsummer or um, mm. the Babadook. Would you call Clockwork Orange elevated? Sure. Uh, that's. I mean, just I don't, because I it's so niche. I have to ask that question. Well, that's a Clockwork Orange would fall under like dystopian fiction. I mm-hmm. think sci-fi maybe. I'd say it's more. it's a science fiction classic. It's, yes. it, so yeah. would you call it elevated? It's good. Uh, it's good literature. Period. I've never read it. Neither have I. It's, it's, it's good. It's good again, cinema. That's why I'm asking. Is it, okay, is it elevated? Movie. So I you... I find I'm at a bit of a. How can I put this? <laughs> okay, so for me, what makes genres fascinating in and of themselves, before the author even approaches the work is that each genre has its own merits Mm -hmm. and those merits may be the only reason that you start playing around with it so for example if you're going to go create a, a western the only thing that you really need to know is that it's about the american old west you know, if you're from the UK or you're from China or you're from Japan and you are obsessed with the Old West, you know, why shouldn't Haruki Murakami write an Old West, a, a Western? He could. He's obsessed with the United States. So, I mean, you know, just the whole idea of like, so you don't have to be somebody special to write a Western. You don't even have to know Westerns to write a Western. The idea behind the Western is embedded in so much culture that you could, you know, than the idea of the American Western. So the idea it has to be of, in like yes, a, the, the desert. Idea. It has to be like the desert. Well, it, has to be, it has to be. It has to be a. It has to be in some sense. It has to capture in some sense that time and what it's. And it, but it doesn't have to be historically accurate. That's the other thing about westerns yeah. is that westerns are not historical fiction. One could call them a branch of historical fiction, I suppose. But the difference is that Westerns are not trying to be accurate at Mm -hmm. all. If they were, they would not be so predominantly white as they are. And they would include the incredible amounts of racism that occurred in, in so much Westerns. But they don't have that impetus to them. You don't need them to be accurate. You just need them to have some kind of drive. And that I think that drive is about the frontier experience, you know, whatever that may be, whether it's accurate or not accurate. It's it's something about the frontier experience, that that living on the edge of life kind of thing. That's what people want to see. That's what they go for. Um, and however you choose to tell that is your choice. If you're writing pulp westerns, you're going to have a showdown. <laughs> you, you, you have to. Because it's a, it's a pulp western. You that's like the checkbox thing where it's like, well, in order to have, yeah, right, in order to have this be a, an actual Western, I have to have a, when, for example, because the first Star Wars movie is a space Western, when Vader and Kenobi face each other, you notice how the stormtroopers are standing there watching. Because of course they are. It's a standoff in the classic Western tradition. So are you saying that if we were watching the original, uh, the first uh, Star Wars, and we put the good, the bad, and the ugly over top yeah, of that? Yeah, absolutely. Us, absolutely. Exactly yeah, a you're, so, you're supposed to be able to. That's the entire point. That's why Tatooine is Tatooine. It's supposed to be a, It's that entire um, planet is him going, by the way, you're not dumb if you think this is a western <laughs> space because that's exactly what it is and like he play he pulls all those strings because there's no I mean you know at the point in cinema there was no such thing as space opera <laughs> and all the old space opera stories were mariner's tales in space or westerns maybe there's the whole thing anyway so that's what I find fascinating about genres is that each genre has its own specific merits for why people want to use them and they they lend themselves to certain kinds of thought patterns or themes or ideas that are better handled in one genre as opposed to another one. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So look, for example, if you were going to tell the story, if you were going to sort of dive into the idea of good and evil Mm -hmm. and like just say, you know, there is good, there is evil, you would not choose a contemporary story of realism to do that. That is the worst possible way to get that done because no one's going to buy 
that your who whichever character you dig out of anywhere has to be so obviously bad that they're a joke. Whereas, whereas in you know a fantasy story, the character, the characters wickedness or bad ways are not seen as extravagant it's like well yeah of course that person burned a whole village look at him he looks evil you know it's just that whole idea of like you know upping the ante for them is is almost a little harder because they're already viewed a certain way based on maybe what colors they're wearing or and yeah it is pulpy right that, that's the whole pulp thing is like well how can you tell darth vader is evil he's wearing black and he breathes like a machine like my hero academia hulking. how do we know that all for one's a bad guy well he's his whole entire powers he steals other powers for a living yeah. i don't know yeah. like, it's, it's right it's, there in it's, front of you it's very it's they it's everyone's talking in symbols in all why the is this character such a bad one well he can dissolve them by touching them mm-hmm. it's the same thing i mean the same thing is true of romance how do you know who's gonna fall in love well if you're watching heartstopper as soon as you see those little animated hearts appear or little leaves blowing around it's like oh well we know because you're supposed to they're not you know, in Korean drama, it's, it's like you see them literally do a stare down with each other, or they hate each other, and you're like, "Yep, it's those two right there." Yeah, so it's not. It's, not, it's never the second it's, male lead. It's always that yeah. first one right there. But the thing that's interesting too about genres is that they also have traditions, and within and when I say traditions, I mean histories. I mean they have things that they have. They have they have people who have done this, you know, for centuries and you can go in and look at it and see who did what and why they did and how they did and all those kinds of things and and those that can be really interesting for someone who wants to play in genre to go in and explore you know almost like if their own ideas are enough of what if does that make sense i don't know I feel like this is more my way of doing things and it would drive other people other creatives a little insane because there's the thing of like wanting to tell the story that you want to tell so just do it right and then there's the other thing of like double checking and making sure that you're enough checking does that make boxes. sense like check yeah like like there is a sort of a checking of a box thing that i think um is helpful it can also be a hindrance depending on who you are um and how you work and i mean i, I don't i don't know i'm talking in circles i think do you have any other questions <laughs> I'm trying to think of a question, which is probably why I was thinking. <laughs> you're just going to get it really well. Okay, I, actually. Uh, <laughs> okay, yes, I do. I have, okay, so. Um, if you could choose. Okay. A, if you could choose a favorite creative person or creative team and force them to make some, not force them, but wish with all the stars that they would create in a, a genre that they've not yet created in, which genre would you put them to the test? Do they have to be alive? No, they do not. <laughs> I mean, obviously I'll, I'll, I'll go to film and my choice would be Kubrick. What would you have him make? Well, I mean, he kind of jumped over the genre spectrum throughout his career. So. Most movie directors do, you know. No, I know, I know. Yeah, no, no, sorry, that was not meant to be. That was not. To, that was not to sound critical. That was meant to sort of. I have a whole thing about movie directors and how they're so much cooler than writers because they get to do that. Mm-hmm. It's natural for them to do that and expected. Yes, yeah, very the, rarely are they boxed in. Right. Maybe people like uh, uh, who did the Nightmare on Elm Street. Movies. Oh, uh, like he, he felt that he was boxed in. And Sam he, Raimi was it? no. Sam he, Raimi's also something. No, he else. tried to do a romance that flopped. Then he sadly went back to horror. <laughs> and then, but, sure. but but anyways, um, as I say that though, I, I'm trying to think of a a uh, genre that he didn't do because mm. he did sci sci-fi, sci-fi with 2001 horror with The Shining. Yeah, maybe uh, I'd like to see him because he did historical fiction. Maybe. Uh, I was gonna say, um, fantasy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, yeah. I just like to get another movie out of them. Especially because fantasy films, in and of themselves, have had a really rough 
really rough history cinematically. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> maybe if like he would have lived a few more years, and well, then he would have been. No, that would have been around the time of the Lord of the Rings. So fantasy would. So it could have been interesting to see him do. Yeah, maybe to get like fantasy. the fun thing. Would you something. Would you like to see him take a crack at something like a property as big as the Lord of the Rings, or would you probably prefer not. him to do something a little less known? A little less that. known. Sure. Like sure. Preferably a single self-contained book mm-hmm. adaptation. I don't know what that would be. I'm trying to think what book he could do that would be. <laughs> Okay, yeah, no, that's interesting. Like maybe uh, something something with a lot of layers, like that would that would merit multiple like viewings and stuff. Sure. Um, or with the possibility of multiple layers, maybe like something by Gaiman or something. Mm, ooh, Stanley Kubrick like, directing a Neil Gaiman book. Like that even could be interesting. Even his take on like an American Gods or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that that could be interesting. That I don't. Could be I, I'm really not sure when American Gods came out. You probably. But. Um. I think Kubrick died shortly after American Gods came out. So yeah, he died like ninety nine. Yeah, so it like, was tr- like a couple of years after. A American week Gods. after he completed the final cut of Eyes Wide Shut, which is crazy. People tend to do that though. Well, Cormac sure. McCarthy died right after he finished his final. American Gods yeah, came out sure. in two thousand one. Two thousand one. Okay. Did it? Two thousand nineteen to two thousand one. Oh, that's right. You're right. So shortly after Kubrick's death. Okay. Yep. So that's my choice. Fans, yeah. Uh, he died in two nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. So that could be interesting. That yeah, Kubrick and ooh, Kubrick and American Gods. Stanley Kubrick's American Gods. Yeah, I'm here for that. That sounds great. Because <laughs> um, there's, there's an underrated dark humor in his stuff. Anyways. Yeah, and America. I mean, America. Yeah. Come on. Um, Aaron. All of my studios are actually doing things that I want them to oh. do. Because <laughs> I'm talking video game formats. Uh, sure. Uh, so right now, something that I really like, and they've done other things before, but um, Obsidian, Black Isle. Um, if you've ever played the game, uh, if, if you've ever played Fallout New Vegas, it's mm-hmm. that group of people. Sure. They came out with a group called the Outer Worlds, which is their oh, yeah, space well. version, <laughs> yeah. which uh, I... Absolutely adored playing sure. that one. Um, sure. Very much within their Fallout theme. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to see them go back to a more Western setup eventually, sure. like their Fallout theme that they were doing. Because mm-hmm. um, Fallout One and Two, and then New Vegas are all basically like West Coast style yeah. things. Yeah. Um, with how they they create their games, um, mm-hmm. a lot of the so in New Vegas, there's a lot of Western themes, m- minus the whole, like, stare-down situations. Um, well, I mean, technically, you could call the final boss a stare-down, but you can legitimately talk him out of fighting you, and that's how that ends. <laughs> um, yeah. You can but... literally tend charisma yourself, and you can literally finesse your way out of the whole entire the, conversation. The number one rule of Western Showdown is someone has to be seen dying. Yeah, so you Even can... if they don't actually die. But, like, you can do that. They have to be seen that. dying. Well, I mean, you can push the other guy off of the... Hoover Dam. So, I mean, there's that. But, like, they do what they're doing really well, and I think they're creating a sequel to The Outer World, so I'm kind of excited Mm -hmm. to see the direction that they're going. And anybody who hasn't played that game, um, you are kind of like a... You've been like... I don't remember if you were revived or something like that, but you were a space person and every single planet is a different corporation. Sure. by a different corporation. Very space opera idea. And it's very space opera yeah. at that point. But it's also uh, the ship, the guy that you, you were supposed to go find a guy. Mm-hmm. He ended up dying. So you take his identity mm-hmm. and you just roll with it. And it doesn't matter if you're a man, female, non-binary, whatever. You just take their identity and you roll with it and everyone yeah. else just rolls with you. Nice. And so it's you create like a little ragtag group and I'm kind of excited to see if they continue with that ragtag group or if oh, they yeah. don't. Yeah. It just depends. Um, I, and then as good as they do it, yeah. I would like to see though that's yet to be seen because I haven't finished Baldur's Gate 3 yet but maybe Larian Studios who does Baldur's Gate Divinity Original Sin they very much stick to their fantasies sure I would sure. like to see them maybe branch upwards into the space maybe okay. see a space D&D type thing going on oh you, I, I'm thinking like okay. I mean, so that's let my let doable. my brain just kind of roll with it but like kind of Outer Worlds Mass Effect meets D and D, where you have those same elements of every Larian game, D and D game. Yeah. But it's a space themed, and it's 
primarily out in space. Yeah. And so when yeah. you're going places, you travel to your different planets or whatever. Sure. And sure. You can have those. Like, it'd be a bigger map. It might be kind of difficult. Right. But, but I it, think you know. if I had to say I'd like to see them try to do something out in that aspect. Yeah. Just to see what they can come up with. Because, like, in mm-hmm. fantasy, like, they, like, 100... 10 out of 10 they kill it yeah because they're just really good at doing the most weirdest stuff and just like throwing it into the pot and it mm-hmm. just works i'd I... like to see them roll with either like a westerny or like a space theme just to see yeah. what other shenanigans they can just pull out of nowhere i would love to see i have two actually um <laughs> i would love to see christopher paulini mm-hmm. do either a western I think he'd be really good at Western Seas from Montana. So, you know, he would just... <laughs> he, he has to be good the, at him. All of the, the Christopher ways, Polini, if you're listening to this, but you're not. The way Western in which he describes certain settings in Aragon, it's like, oh, yeah, he'd be really good at Westerns. Um, <laughs> I, I really think he would be. Um, and I... But I also want to see him <laughs> in a completely different way. I want to see what he would do with superheroes. Ooh. Because he's so weird. Like, his... Like... Aragon was like a was like the the most normal his books are ever going to get, um, but I'm interested. I'm like he could do he wouldn't just do your standard superhero story, mm-hmm. and that's what would mean. I would be like, mm, where where is he going with this? So I would be interested in one of those two from him. With Brandon Sanderson, I want to see him. He's done this in short stories mm-hmm. because he says that he can't do them long form or he hasn't been able to do the long form and technically he kind of has already done them with his Skyward series because those are mm-hmm. those are space operas I would like to see him do like what he's done with Way of Kings but as a space opera thing Ooh. so like do like this epic multi-volume space opera saga mm-hmm. one because those are so out of fashion right now um, I mean, I feel like they, he could just they, roll with it and it work I say that they're out of fashion they are and they aren't they're, the British writers the British space opera writers are they're all over Booming. that right now but they're boring um, because you know Fair. they're all like ooh let's get the real science of space flight I'm like nobody goes to this for real science of space flight get out of here give me sandworms or give me nothing like <laughs> stop going hard sci-fi yeah. give me the fun yeah, I, sci-fi if I please. want pulp I want monsters bursting out of the ground why did the monster burst out of the ground I don't know nobody I, I need the, I need the <laughs> alien popping out of the chest please like stop yeah. trying to tell me that. also I want and this is never going to happen, even though he should have already done it by this point, and I don't know why he hasn't. I feel like he kind of did that with Rancors and doesn't need to do them anymore. But if we, if he leaves this planet and George Lucas has not made a Godzilla movie, what did we have George Lucas for? Petition. That makes, that makes a lot of Can sense. Can we do a petition? Right? Can we would, do a petition? He would be fantastic <laughs> as a Godzilla. Because it's... Godzilla. It's what he does. I mean, he just puts monsters. I mean, he'd be, he'd be great. He'd be great. I would love to see the characters that he creates around that. And because I feel like the character, for me, the reason I don't watch Godzilla movies is because, well, they're dumb. The character, it's, it's the formula. It's not just the, the, there's the, it's not just the formula. There is, a, there is a way to kill Pulp Fiction. And the way to kill it is to not give me good characters. Yes, I get it. You have to have Godzilla come out of the ground and kill people and all that kind of thing. That doesn't mean that your characters have to be dull. One of the reasons that Peter Jackson's, um, uh, uh, Hobbit or no, Lord of the Rings? No. King Kong? King Kong was dreadful. <laughs> hard, hard disagree on that. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I I'm, a, I'm a pretty big fan of Oh, I hate that movie. King Kong. Because the characters stop being interesting. They start off in a really cool place. Once the monkey shows up, everybody's character starts dissolving. And I'm, I'm like, about to watch I wonder, Grant I, and Tony fight over King no, Kong. No, no, no. Tony has I should have made Tony sense. has a point. They take a back seat. I should have yeah, made Which sense. I get. But, to the monkey. But, this, but, <laughs> but the, the monkey stuff is so entertaining that... I, well, yes. <laughs> yes, but again, I give you this is bad pulp fiction. If all of a sudden your character plots don't matter because giant monkey... It's not a perfect film. <laughs> you know, it's I mean, it's watch, not so. as bad as Transformers. Dear Lord, no. all the Transformers no, I know. should be burned. I only watch the cartoons. Um, I've only seen the cartoons. Well, those are great. Exactly. <laughs> but, so uh, I only have the greatness because I watch the cartoons. All right, so I have a final question. Oh, no. This is terrifying. I'm and terrified. it's what would have come out of the, the bucket. It's only... It's, it, it's, I have modified it because technically the last question was going to be that question, but the one I just asked was going to be that question, but I've come up with a different one. Fair. If you could, and I hope this is as hard as I think it's going to be, 
if you could obliterate any active genre and all of its associated works from the face of the planet, what genre would it be? And why? And you have three minutes. Okay, how specific can we get? Or what, what like, if, if we do, like... Yeah, how specific? Or do we have to be, like, the, uh, choose a big genre, like romance, sci-fi, comedy, comedy. Yeah, I would prefer those. I really okay. hate, Dang like... Because if we get really rid of, like, hate, like werewolf like, romance, then yeah. that's not... No, the because I was about to say there. Christmas... Christmas... Ooh, Christmas honestly, stories. I'm, I'm with you. Sure. I don't... I, 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 oh, no, nothing? It's because, it's because you don't know Chris, Christmas mythology. No, I know Christmas mythology. I just... Do, it's, it's. Do you though? Has there, but a lot of my exposure has been that section over there in the if corner. If you have not, if you have not read and, Dickens all the way before, then you have right. no idea what I'm you're throwing out. I'm not interested in Dickens at all. You don't have to be interested in Dickens. But like, it's just. I'm just saying just, that his Christmas stories are some of his best work. Sure. And before his Christmas stories, the stuff that he built them out of, that mythology is. That's endlessly like, fascinating. Great, but like also just like any of those are just. <laughs> so, do you mean, also, when you say Christmas things, do you mean like Christmas romances or Christmas? So you're not considering like, Christmas as a genre in itself. It can't be because there's okay. there's too much. Historic. I'm going with romance then. I'm gonna yeah. throw my hat in and it's gonna all make the romances angry. and all the world like all uh, of them. Okay. Any right. Christ- fair. Christmas Christian fictions? No, thank you. Wait, Christian fiction or Christmas no, both. Christian? Both. Oh, okay. Because I just I get bored. Yeah, we didn't and... even talk about Christian fiction. No, we which did is not. a genre. Which is really funny. Well, because actually, I literally it's... have it on display out so, there. So <laughs> actually, I would say no. I would say that I don't think that Christian fiction is a genre. I think it is a flavor. I think it is a it can take many category. Forms. In the well, same that way flavor that, can go. In the same way that YA or middle grade or those are age categories, Christian fiction is like a a category. However. Even Amish fiction is like a subcategory of Christian fiction, but it's it's not really a genre unto itself. The, it has the appeal of the Amish from. fiction genre continues <laughs> to elude me. I have not read any, so I can't. I mean, I haven't either. But I cannot say. Um, I feel like I don't have to read so one. Here, but I here's think the that thing. I don't. I have some hunches, but this isn't think, the episode to get into. Now, I think that that is. I think that is absolutely absurd and outlandish. One should have to read a genre in order to dismiss it. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying Honestly. is, I need to assign us all to read one so we can. Come I didn't talk say about that. It. I'm just saying. You're that you putting have, it out I'm there. saying that you I. I can't, I'm just saying I won't dismiss something that uh-huh. I have not read because I think that that is unfair. I just, I, I get, it, like, I, 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 I have I made like, that same point. I like And the I, clean, I'm a hypocrite for that. Yeah. Like, I like the clean and wholesome part sometimes because sometimes my brain is liking the flavor of just, like, no spice in there at all. Like, no thanks. Like, just have that. Oh, sure. But, okay. like, okay. it's just the overarching, like, kind of, like, Guilt trippiness sometimes that comes with it. I don't like. Again, I haven't so read I don't to like really that. Be able um, to say. And it's kind of the same with Christmas. Some like not 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 your Charles Dickens, but like. No, I know. I mean, I was the, talking about the current the, the, the current crop of like the Fern Michaels and. Yeah, it's just like I read them and I just kind of go like. Eh. No, no, I get because it's always it it. it remember the Hallmark movie. episode. Yeah, it's 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 all like how it's just like the same. Yeah, but format. see, those are those are romances, and romances are always the same format. It doesn't matter if they're Christmas, if they're contemporary, if they're historical. Well, I specifically it's... don't want the Christmas romance. I'm just like, I'm done That's with fair. it. I'm That's like, fair. no. I would say for me, the thing, the genre that if I could, I really even though I'm I really don't right feel now, this but... way, but if I could, especially because of the last hundred years. Uh, I would obliterate realism from the face of the planet immediately and all of its practitioners. That's actually I don't think that valid. they have helped literature. I don't think that they've improved literature. I think that they are quite more a detriment to us than they are a... a How would you define it? Uh, realism is basically, you know, you you are attempting to get to the heart of what how, why human beings are the way that they are and you're using fiction in order to do that. Oh yeah, no, fully and sub, I like Tony's while, answer too. While I think that there are people who have, I mean, Tony Morrison is a is a favorite. So there are people who can do this extremely well and and just as well as any other genre, and I don't discount that or discredit that, but I think that it has taken over in a way that is un... Like, it's mystifying to me, because I'm like, this isn't any better than anything else. Like, no, that's... It's just... 
that's the same way I feel about art or um, how like representational art versus abstract art, mm-hmm. where we have this unlimited uh, power of imagination to create whatever we want, and we're going to draw pictures of fruit. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't care how well you can draw pictures of fruit and how real to life. It now is. you know how yes. I feel when I was sitting in art classes and they had a bowl of fruit in front of us telling you draw the fruit, and I'm like. No. I don't want to draw and the fruit. Be like the Greeks, make up the human image. Yeah. Yeah.